Wall Street veteran Bernard Madoff has been arrested and charged with running a $50 billion Ponzi scheme. Congress wants to know what caused the Enron meltdown. Now, well, the collective rage currently is focused on Wilcom. Tyco CEO Dennis Koslowski was convicted of looting hundreds of millions of dollars. This yeah. is one of the biggest fraud cases ever. Their president's a crook. Well, I'm not a crook. Find out more on this week's episode of White Collars, Red Hands. In 2021, the worldwide wine consumption was estimated to be 236 million hectoliters. I did not even know hectoliters existed. Isn't it like a specific measurement only in wine that it's like used basically only in wine? I don't know. I think so. I remember seeing like a chart that had all the sizes and that was like one of them. I didn't know about it. The wine industry is booming, and thanks to the pandemic, it's more profitable than ever. This year alone, in the U.S., the wine industry is set to make $53.58 billion and is expected to grow over 10% by the year 2025. When we're drinking wine, we often are noting the flavor profiles and admiring the taste after a long day of work. On special occasions, we will pop the cork on something other than barefoot and buy the fancier stuff. But as you put that high-priced grape juice to your lips, do you ever question the authenticity? Are you really drinking what you think you're drinking? Who would lie about that? Well, people do. Find out today who did it and how they did it on this week's episode of White Collars, Red Hands. Are are you telling me you're really sitting at home drinking a glass of wine after a day of work being like, oh my God, the tannins in this are just... I don't. Delicious. You said that's normal. I feel like if people are getting home, slogging down a glass of wine because they're just a little too sober after work. Well, if you're drinking it though, you know if you like it or if you don't like it. Yeah, I mean... You drink it and you're I like, guess. this one tastes like red meat. Like red meat? Some r- red wines taste like red meat. Mm, hints of hamburger? Maybe. Yeah, like steak. Uh, a, a faint whiff of ribeye, perhaps? Have you never tasted this? No. Oh, well, I have. I think wine tastes like wine. I'm the, opposite of, I'm the opposite of a wine snob. It's like they all kind of taste a little different, but like most, mostly red and mostly white are kind of the same. Not red and white together, but like reds are like, hey, yeah, there's red wine and whites are like, hey, those are white wine for the most part. There are some, that they're, they're not all created equal. I'll drink chillable red Franzi out of the box. I'm, that was my I'm shit in college. I'm trash when it comes to wine. I, that was my shit in college. I loved a good Franzia in the fridge. Well, what's changed? <laughs> I don't drink Franzia anymore. I am... Oh. I have uh, I have matured. Oh, fancy. Now I eat sauerkraut and drink real wine. Because I used to not eat sauerkraut. Oh, okay. Yeah, I used to not like it. Well, welcome back to this week's episode of White Collars, Red Hands. This is... I'm Kashan. And I'm Nina. And this week we are going to be talking about wine. Yeah. So get- Wine fraud. Did you even know it existed? I didn't until my manager, Neil, told me about this story. Well, he's not my manager anymore. Um, he fell off the face of the earth, and we're actually not quite sure if he's alive. But thanks for the suggestion, Neil. Oh. Uh, okay. He kind of, like, quit on the spot. And then um, I asked our other manager if he had heard from him because they're friends. And he's like, no, I'm not really sure if he's alive. Oh, man, I thought you Men fell off the face of the earth because the earth is flat. Well, it is. So, yeah. I don't know if you heard that, but. I've I've read one or two. Can you believe these round earth theory people? It's crazy how popular it's getting. Ridiculous. (laughs) Ridiculous. But yeah, he suggested the episode. We decided to do it. This week's nice and lighthearted, fun, easy to understand. I didn't have any issues. Yeah, no. uh, Getting it. No accounting scandal like it was uh, last week with Olympus. What is it? We're just talking about wine, which funnily enough, both of us, hospitality industry. I was a beverage yes. director for a while. So who knows? Maybe we'll have some actual insightful input. This is the first time we're doing something where we've had like hands-on experience with it. Right? We don't have hands-on experience with this. All right. These people are drinking way fancier shit than we've ever dealt All with. All right. Never, never mind. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> we're talking thousands of dollars per bottle. Ugh. Yeah. Thousands. All right, let's get started. So today we are going to be, I'm, I'm going to butcher a lot of names today. 
Just like normal. Worse than normal. Um, mm, I'm going to okay. do my best. Let's see. I'll be the judge of that. So today we're going to be talking about Rudy Kurniawan. He was born on October 10th. Happy belated birthday. Um, he was born on October 10th, 1978 in Jakarta, Indonesia. Um, his birth name is actually... Oh, yeah. Let's go. Zhen Wan Huang. Um, his family uh, immigrated to Indonesia from China, but his father ended up changing his name and gave him the name Rudy Kurniawan because of the racism against the Chinese in Indonesia. And he knew it would be easier for his son if he had an Indonesian name. Oh, so Kurniawan is an Indonesian name? Yeah. Okay. Why? why I, I find it hard to believe that Rudy... The uh, star of the Notre Dame football team is is the name of like an Indonesian, like a normal Indonesian person. But well, okay. Well, funny you say that. He and his brother both have the names of Indonesian badminton players. Oh, so they just so turned on they ESP. literally like picked a famous person, and we're just like, yeah, it's like you naming your son like Tom Brady. Yeah. Yep. Just, you're like, it's you're like, coming to America? That, oh, yeah, you're it's Tom like Brady you now. moved here and you were like, what's the most American name I can give my son? Tom Brady. And then you name your son that. Great. Someone's done it. So he went to California State University in the late 90s. Um, couldn't find if he actually graduated or not, but he came over here in the late 90s and started studying. Yeah, let's just say no. I'm taking it away from him. All right. No, he didn't. All right. It's a fact now. Well, while Rudy was coming on over here, the wine auction business started booming in the 90s. And it was really, it was a status thing to be at these auctions bidding on wine. And Kurniawan actually started going to wine auctions and started delving into the wine world in the early 2000s. Just now, like for fun? So, yes, he, I do truly believe that this man loved wine. I think he loved good wine. We're going to find out what he did. I think that, yeah, I think he had money to blow. He went into the wine business and, I mean, he's on the show, so you know he's scamming people. So you find out. But I think he liked wine. And so then he just started going to the shit. I mean, it's like fucking Comic-Con. Like, people get, you know, or Pokemon. Like, people really get into it. And then they start, like... <laughs> Trading shit for exor exorbitant, whoa, 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 crazy prices. And so, what you're saying is he was a wine nerd. Yeah, he was a fucking nerd. Okay. Great. All these people at wine auctions are fucking wine nerds. That's and fair. I will go on record and say that. Yeah, you're, it's fair. If you spend $20,000 on a bottle of wine, you're a fucking nerd. Hey, you got it, man. That's a, that's in, that's a grade A alpha black lotus right there for sure. Yes. I don't know what that means. Anyways. <laughs> Maureen Downey, she's a wine consultant who frequents the auction, auctions. She says that Kurniawan was a young, geeky kid when he came on the scene, and he was basically just drinking California Merlots. But 18 months later, he actually reached out to her because he wanted to actually become part of the auction scene, like actually selling, the buying, co-signing, stuff like that. Um, and it was funny. She, You can tell that she, like... I mean, obviously, she's been doing this a long time. She's really in the business. But she was like, I just found it so strange because he had been drinking California Merlots. And then he's wanting to be a part of this industry. He's drinking California Merlot. I remember when I said that we might know a little bit about this? You don't know. I don't know what the fuck that means. Like, California Merlot is not, like, not good? Well, apparently not to Maureen Downey. Okay. So this doesn't really have to do with the story. But something interesting that I found that Maureen Downey was talking about was that... Um, the fine wine world is made up of mostly men. Um, and Downey is one of the few women who are extremely active in the scene. And she said she would often be mistaken as someone's girlfriend when she started going to the auctions because it was so rare that there was a woman there. And I just find it interesting because I always... I always felt like growing up, and I feel like even still, wine is pitched as like a woman's drink. It's like mommy juice. We're having wine night with the girls. Like yeah. what? Like we go out and drink beer with the bros. Like you never hear the guys be like, let's have a wine night. Well, it's it's because wine pairs well with sausage. That's why there's so many guys at these auctions. So you think there'd be more women? I think this is a lot like uh, being a chef. Or like oh, cooking. yeah, absolutely. Uh, yeah. You know how like cooking is, is traditionally seen as like, oh, it's a woman's job to cook. But then they're like, oh, but if you want to do it seriously, yeah, you have to have a penis. Yeah. And that's that's I feel like that's this. The no, the I think it's this. very similar yeah. to that. Um, by 2006, Kurniawan was spending up to one million dollars a month buying auction lots. The man 
had money. And he gained the nickname Dr. Conti because of his love of the Burgundy con- producer, Domain de la Romane Conti. Huh. Uh, it's French. I, I cooked with Burgundy. Up. People just drink Burgundy? So, Burgundy, yeah, people drink it because. Oh, okay. Um, it was noted that he was extremely knowledgeable about wine. It was also said that he had an amazing palate and he could taste the wine and know exactly where it came from. Oh yeah, this came from a grape. <laughs> <laughs> I have a man- so there are so Neil who left, and I also have another manager who they're both sommeliers, and they literally will smell it. Well, they'll swirl it, smell it, taste it, and they can tell you where it came from. Isn't that crazy? And they don't know beforehand? Like, it's not No, like you, like, don't tell them beforehand, and they blind taste it. And that's how Rudy was. He could just blind taste it and be like, yep. And, and like, he could give the year. It was crazy. Wow. Yeah, that means they're, like, a high-level Somalia. Yeah. Not the top level, though, because I think there's only... Isn't there, like, 10 or something? I think there's a... No, there's more than the 10, I think. Not a lot more. It's hard to be a top-tier Somalia. Yeah. You can get level one easy, though. It's, like, 50 bucks online. Mm. So you want to learn about wine? There you go. And then you can like call yourself a Somalia. An, and then it's like being an ordained minister. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you can yeah. marry people and shit for 50 bucks. Um, there was a lot of wine tasting in this one documentary that I watched, and I just want to note that everyone who goes to a wine tasting is a fucking pussy because they all spit out the wine. Fucking drink that shit and get drunk. Not everyone's a swallower from, from I know. personal Spitters experience. Spitters are quitters. If you... Oh, my God. Uh, that's a, it's a lot of wine, Nina. Like, <laughs> it's not... Like I think, I think if they swallow, what they just it, can't take it. They'd be some, can't swallow that much. They would stop. Uh, <laughs> they would be drinking something like, like four bottles of wine by the end of the tasting or something. They haven't done that before. Actually, the most I've ever drank is two. I'm about to say that's a lot of a lot, well, that's a lot of wine. <laughs> um, the most I ever drank was two, and I blacked out. Sounds about right. At my friend's reception. Uh, See, they're not uh, trying rehearsal to, dinner. They're not rehearsal trying to black dinner. out at the tasting night. They're trying to have fun. I had fun. I'm sure you did. If I only did you could remember cry it. for 40 minutes um, because I loved her so much. Anyways, people would say that uh, Kearney Yuan's family was extremely wealthy and that they owned the Heineken distribution in China. Um, but that was actually all rumors. No one really knew about his background. He was very quiet about his background. That was my question. I was like, you're t- saying he's spending all this money, but like... Where'd he get it from? We're going to find out at the end of the episode. Okay. But he was very wealthy and he wouldn't tell anybody where the money came from. And people actually really wouldn't push him on this because he was so generous. He was a very generous person. Like people were talking about how, oh, he gave me this bottle of wine for my birthday or he gave me this bottle of wine for my birthday. Thousands of dollars. He would host these like very elaborate dinners for people. He was very kind. So people just were like, all right, he's this rich dude. They really didn't ask very many questions. So he becomes really involved with the wine auction scene. And in 2006, he co-signs lots with John Capon, who was the CEO of Actor Merrill and Condit. Oh, yes. All things I recognize. So Acker, Merrill, and Condit is a big wine auction distributor. Like, they oh, okay. hold these huge wine auctions. Um, every, anybody who's anybody is going to these. And John Capon was the CEO at the time. And he got involved in this because his family owned a wine shop. Um, and that's how he was introduced to wine. That's how he was able to make Acker, Merrill, and Condit the big auction fr- front runner that it became. Um so Capon actually turned the wine auctions into something fun because prior to that, it was pretty boring and, um, you know, it was stuffy, but he turned this into a fucking party that people would want to go to. And so um, he and Kearney on do this cosign. Now, Kearney on also, I I should have mentioned this a little bit earlier. He had a very extensive wine cellar. He had a one, like he knew where to get the most rare wines, he, thousands of dollars worth of wines, thousands of dollars a bottle. He had, you know, he knew what was good. He knew where to buy it. And he had just all this excess wine that he was able to get. I'm hoarding it like a wine dragon. Well, yeah, we will get to that. So he co-signs with um, Capon in 2006. And after Kearney Juan sold, and so after they come together, they sell $35 million worth of wine in two sales. Oh. 
That's a lot. Right? Yes. Right? That's a lot. That's a lot. That's All a right, lot. So, yeah. Well, I don't know in the wine 35 world. Thirty-five million dollars in two sales. It's a lot. All right. Acker, Merrill, and Condit became the number one wine auction house in the world. And they were actually the first wine auction house to auction off $100 million in wine. Who's, oh God, the, the person buying $100 million of wine must be terrible. Oh yeah. You're spending $100 million well, on Well, it's wine. not, it's not one person spending $100 million oh, in wine. This is just, auction, this is just at the auction. Much. Oh, yeah. Okay. Still. Now, we will talk about a man later who I have no idea how much of this man sold on wine. We're going to get to his extensive collection. However, he spent millions on wine. Like these people, like this is a world that I did not even know about before researching this story that people will spend this. Like I knew people bought fine wine. Yeah. I'm not stupid. Yeah. But these people collect wine like people collect cars or stamps. That's or things like that. Now, they were claiming to inspect all of this wine to make sure that it was legit, etc. But um, it was extremely difficult to do so because of the volume that they were selling. I guess that's fair. They were just picking up bottles being like, yeah, that looks like wine. Yeah. On to the next they one. Were, they, were drinking, they, they were selling bottles of wine that were going for $20,000 plus. Dollars. Well, it, can't, it can't be that good. It cannot be worth twenty. No wine that would ever pass my lips. I'd be like, "This is worth twenty thousand dollars." My car was not that much money. I think the the top I would ever spend for a bottle of wine, sixty bucks. Maybe. It better be fucking good. Yeah, and it better because be because I'll tell you what. There's some Menage a Trois. The wine, or yeah, okay, great. I've never had one, but the <laughs> wine, incredible. Coco Bon. Buy it at Trader Joe's. I don't even know. Red I, blend. I shop at Trader Joe's, so I don't know. That. Incredible. Boda Box. Boda Boxes are pretty good. Boda honestly. Box is. Get a bo- I forgot about Boda Box. Yeah. Get a Boda Box, folks. Get a Boda Box. I drank a lot of Boda Box during the pandemic. So, anyways, the, there was a huge demand for old fine wine, and Burgundy wine became almost unattainable. Crazy. And Kearney Awan was cornering the market with wines. He was buying it all up, and then he would raise the prices on them and. You know, kind of like stock almost. Like just, well, it's almost like pump and dump. Like he would buy all these, bring the price up, and then he would sell them. Yeah, which is, it's market manipulation, but you can do it in secondary markets. I mean, there's yeah. nothing, there's nothing stopping someone from doing that. It's just seen as shitty. Like Martin Shkreli, actually, since I already mentioned um, a Black Lotus, so Magic the Gathering. He, another, oh, that's what that is? Yes. Another shitty thing he did is, oh. that, is that he went and he would buy like old cards that they're not printing anymore and like buy them to raise the price and then resell them at the peak. Like he did this with magic cards. I remember that. Yeah. Up to like thousands of dollars for cards and then he'd sell them all off at their peak. Um, it wasn't long after, you know, he's selling all these wines. He's getting all these like really rare wines and people are like, how are you getting these? Um, it wasn't long after that, that the legitimacy of these wines were being questioned. And in 2007, Kearney Awan co-signed several bottles of 1982 Chateau Lapine. I'm probably butchering Chateau that. Chateau Lapine. You heard it here. Mm-hmm. Castle of the Dick. Yeah, um, oh, my God. Have you guys tried the new Dick Castle Cabernet? It's like a phenomenal. It tastes a little funky, but I it's, like it. Mm. <laughs> um. So he sold these bottles to at Christie's in LA. Christie's is a luxury store. I had to look that up. Um, had never heard of it in my life. The only Christie's I knew about was Christie's Cabaret in North Canton, Ohio, which is a strip club. Fun. Yep. We should go sometime. Uh, <laughs> it actually might be fun, actually. Oh, we're not going to a strip club in Ohio. No. I love going to a strip club in Ohio. Okay, well, we have different definitions of fun, I guess. I was like, I'm hotter than all of you. Oh, that's why it's fun. Okay, and It's so fun! Okay, I was like, if they can do it, I can do it. And there's no better feeling than knowing that you could be a stripper. Yeah. Okay. I just can't dance. Okay, well. And then I ate chicken tenders and french fries. <laughs> okay, anyways. <laughs> anyways, keep going. Um, so, 
The bottles were actually featured on the cover of the catalog and reps from Chateau Lapine um, contacted the auction house and told them that the bottles were fake. They were like, no, we didn't sell these bottles. And after reviewing the bottles, Christie's withdrew them. And at another conference, it was also noted that only five bottles of 1947 Lafleur were ever made, which insinuated that the ones that Kearney Awan sold in 06 were fake. Dun, dun, dun. But wait, there's more. Around the same time, there were some issues with some bottles that were being sold on the market. In 2008, Kearney Awan co-signed yet again several bottles of Claus St. Denise. Oh, I know that one's Clo. Clo. Clo Saint Denis. I don't know Clos how to say. Clo Saint Denis. You don't. It's French. Clo Saint say, Denis. You don't say S's in I French. I know. <laughs> Clo Saint Denis. You know, as someone who actually, I'm going to butcher it on purpose just to spite my ex-boyfriend. Yeah, just yeah, spite Fuck all of guy. the French because of one guy. So bottles of Clo Saint Denis. Great. I'm just kidding. Bottles of Clo. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, bottles of Clos Saint Denis. No, Clos Saint Denis. <laughs> Bro, you got this. I believe in you. From Domaine Poisson of vintages between. The, like, none of that makes any sense. Like, I know it's wine from. Uh, Domaine Poisson is the winery, like the vineyard. Okay. Great. So these vintages between 1945 and 1971 were being sold. Now, Laurent Poisson. No, Laurent Poisson. Poisson, oh. who is the head of Domaine Poisson, says that they never made Clos Saint Denis. Clos Saint Denis. This is this is going downhill so fast. <laughs> he said they never made that wine until 1940. Okay, great. We're going to avoid just the, the rest of this episode is going to be the vaguest thing you've ever heard in your life. Oh my God. It's, it's just going to be and that thing and these people. I was even trying to practice and I just can't do it. It's so bad. So anyways, Kearney Awan was saying, hey, I'm selling these wines. They were the vintages are 19. What were they? 1940. 47, right? Yeah, 1947 to 1971. 45 this, to 71. Yeah, yeah, 45 to 71. Here you go. These, mm -mm -mm. look, look at these old wines I have. And the vineyard's like, uh, bitch, no, we didn't start making that wine until 1942. What the hell are you talking about? 1982. I, 1982. What the hell are you talking about? <laughs> so, yeah, I don't even know what the hell I'm talking about. Jesus Christ, I'm going to go on a rant. Anyways, so the Royal Poisson said that the fake wine was, and I quote, dirt on the integrity of Burgundy. Wow. Imagine believing so much. And he so had much. to make it right. Believing so much in wine. Um, like, he said, he also at one point said that heaven is said to be above us, but I don't believe that. I think it's below in the roots of the vines. Wine's not that good, man. Come not on. According to Laurent. Come on. It still gives you a headache in the morning. Let's be honest. Oh my God. If I drink too much wine, I get the worst headache in the morning. He, But he's really passionate about it. Okay. Great. So Poisson contacted the auction house and told them that they were fake and they withdrew the lots. Now, one thing I saw said that he showed up at the auction and was like, those are fake. Don't sell my wine. And then Capon was like, fuck. Okay, I guess I'm not going to sell the wine. But then other things was, uh, that I saw was like, called ahead so i don't know which one's wrong. it's probably the calling ahead nothing is ever that sensational i'm sure he didn't no. fly from france like, Do well, not sell my wine. That's, that's not true he did end up flying oh. from france said, these are fake these are a taint upon the upon the flavor of burgundy <laughs> <laughs> he's the most stereotypical french man ever he walked in wearing a beret and smoking a cigarette he's like he take my wine off the lot that is not ours <laughs> Pizza! <laughs> Pizza! My wine! That wine is a merde. Oh. <laughs> I only know how to say bad things in French. Same. All right. So, Passant demanded to know who owned the wines that allegedly came from his vineyard. And he met, they told him, and he met with Kerniawan the next day. So... He met with Kernion at a restaurant called named Jean George. No, how do Jean you, Georges. No, how do you say George in French? George. 
George, whatever. John George is what this is in English. Anyways, no, they meet at this nice ass restaurant, okay? And he asks Kearney on where he bought those wines. Yeah, where did you buy my wines? <laughs> well, he actually went at him very non accusatory. Oh, okay. And he was just like, hey, I want to... Because he didn't actually know where he got the wine. He was like, hey, uh, where did he you didn't get know, the wine? He knew they were fake, yeah. but he didn't know how Kearney Iwana tamed, obtained them. And so he was like, hey, where'd you get these? Like, I need to know because these aren't real. And I just am trying to get to the bottom of this. So Kearney Iwana claimed that he buys so many wines that he wasn't actually sure where it all came from. Which you, you honestly, paperwork, dude. Well, like, yeah. Go look it. He's up. like off the top of my head. Honestly, I don't know, but I'm gonna go look into it. Passant decided at that point that he was going to make Kearney on his best friend, so that he could win his trust and find out where the wines were actually coming from. Keep your friends close, and your, your enemies, enemies closer. closer. He had him by the bunches, as you could say. Oh yeah. <laughs> Yeah. So Kearney Iwan finally told Passant where he was getting the wine from, and he told him that he bought the wine in Jakarta, Indonesia, <laughs> which uh -huh. I just don't feel like is a very good story. So anyways, Kearney Iwan gave Passant two phone numbers of the people who he bought the wine from. Oh, it's just going to be his phone number, isn't it? So, mm, almost. Oh. So Passant calls the one number, and it's just a fax machine. <laughs> And then okay. um, the other one never answered. And um, they actually ended up finding out that one of the numbers was for Lion Air, which is the biggest, like, it's the biggest airline in Indonesia, which is like a random number for Lion Air. It was probably just a number he could remember. Yeah, probably. <laughs> and then the other was for a strip mall called <sighs> Jalan Jaja Mada. It's a strip mall. Okay. You're going with Jaja for that second one? How would you say it? Gaja? I think it is Gaja. I was like... Why Jalan they... Gaja Mata. There we go. Yeah. It's a strip mall. So anyway, when checking his sources... So, Pasolva was like really on this. Like he cared a lot. Um, it's his legacy. It is. So he like checked out these sources. So he calls the strip mall. He may have even went. I can't remember if he went or if he just called him. So anyways, he gets in contact and people were like, who are you talking about? Who are you talking about? And then... Um, Kearney Iwan actually told him, well, I go by this there. So they'll like know me by this. And basically like, it's the equivalent of Mr. Smith. Oh, great. Yeah. It's like the Mr. Smith of Indonesia. <laughs> and so it's like you giving some, being like, oh yeah, you go ahead and call that place. But they know me by Mr. Smith. And you'll uh, be like, hey, do you know a Mr. Smith? And they'll be like, what the fuck are you talking about? It's like going into a Wisconsin bar and being like, yeah, he drinks He's like an overweight white guy who drinks Bush Light. He goes by you know, Mr. Smith. Yeah. He comes in here and they're like, that's it's like he's a big Packers fan. It's like, that's everyone. Literally here. everyone. I don't know what to tell you. So Passant went to Asia and rubbed elbows with many people from Jakarta. And like I said, no one had ever heard of Rudy Kurniawan. And if his family was of such high social status, wouldn't people know him? Probably. <laughs> Fishy. Fishy fishy so while this is all happening there's another man who fucking loves wine fucking loves it and his name is bill koch okay now koch is a billionaire collector of many things including wine so this man's wine cellar has forty three thousand bottles in it it looks like a fucking movie set why do you need that much wine Compensate for a small penis. Yeah. Okay. You know what's crazy? So he goes, he's like, in this documentary, he's like, here, let me show you my wine cellar. Moves a brick out of the wall, types in a number, puts the brick back in the wall. Like he's hiding the national, like the, like the Declaration of Independence. Yeah. You know, if he pulls out the wrong brick, it opens up to Diagon Alley in Harry Potter. You would think. <laughs> That's what it looked like. The or, cellar looked like Diagon Alley. It was beautiful. I've never seen such a thing in my life. Or just there's a guy behind the brick wall, and he's like, oh, wait, that's where I keep my cask of Amontillado, and he closes it. <laughs> that's a literature joke for you guys. It is. Um, Koch sometimes paid $100,000 per bottle. That's too much. Yep. He's a billionaire. <laughs> um, so Koch actually ended up finding out that two of the bottles in his cellar were fake. Okay. And one of those fake bottles was worth $25,000. Do 
So no, he, it's not. It's worth zero. Well, gotcha. It's worth zero, but it's probably like worth 15. But anyway, he was pissed about this. So he hired a man named Brad Goldstein to investigate because he wanted who and he was a private. He was an he was a detective. He was a hey, private investigator. Brad Goldstein, wine detective. Nice to wine meet you. Wine detective. <laughs> um, he wanted to see how much of his collection was actually fake. Like, could you imagine having so much money? That you hire a private investigator because you're too dumb to know whether or not your wine is real? No. I can't imagine that. <laughs> but um, they were saying that you can sometimes tell that a bottle is fake because of the corks, the weight of the bottle, the paper on the outside of the bottle, etc. So just all the stuff about the fucking bottle? Well, yeah, those are cool. like different things. Well, okay, you look at the bottle and it looks legit but then it's like okay inspect the cork what is is it this type of cork is it have this stamp on it you know there's a lot of different well okay never mind whatever it's just looking at the bottle i mean i guess you just gotta be like what does this usually look like uh, you know what like uh, yes okay i mean yeah they're probably taking like a microscope or something yeah they're like really looking at this shit i wouldn't know and maureen downey remember her the lady who's like all by herself at these wine auctions Uh uh-huh um, she said that she once picked up a fake bottle and almost threw it because the weight of the bottle was so much lighter than it should have been for that brand in that year that she like went to, you know, it's like you go to pick up a 20 pound weight, but it's only 10 and you like that much force. Oh, so geez. she almost threw the fucking bottle because she was like, whoa, that oops, Man, this is fake. Um, when they were inspecting some of the bottles, they found that there was Elmer's glue on a bottle that was allegedly from 1858. Elmer's glue was not did not start being made until the 70s or yeah, 50s or 70s, I think. Oh, really? Yeah. Relatively new. Okay. Yeah. Um, over 400 bottles were proven to be fake, and Koch paid about four million for these wines. Oh, gee, at a twenty-seven thousand. Forty-three thousand. Forty-three thousand. I so forgot the number already. It was like one percent. Yeah, I mean that's still pretty bad. It's so four million dollars is a lot of money yeah, to well, buy hey, fake shit. If you're buying that much wine, though, I mean you're never going to drink it anyway. You're going to get some fake bottles. He had some bottles in his collection that, like, allegedly, like Thomas Jefferson touched. Great. I'm like, like, why do you want that? Like, why do you? You know, believe it or not, Benjamin Franklin once sucked, sucked on the his, top of this wine bottle. Once put his chode in the top of this wine bottle. Yeah. So if you smell closely, ew. <laughs> It's like a it's like a seashell that you pick up on the ocean. You can he, he, and you can hear the ocean in it. If you pick up this wine bottle and smell the tip, you get a little whiff of Benjamin Franklin's penis. So when Koch brought this up to the auction houses, they kind of were just like too bad. <laughs> they like didn't care. Um, I mean, I don't know. I, I don't know what he expected. I feel like at some point it's like there's a risk that some of these are going to be fake. I, oh, absolutely. I, I mean, it's with any antique. So 1% isn't that bad. I know when you put it in the the thing of like, he paid $4 million for these bottles. It's like, yeah, but he paid how many? Multiple, like hundreds of millions for the entire collection. Right. So it's like, it's really not that much. No, it's not that much. And I don't know, when you're selling the this many high volume bottles like how can you possibly inspect it all you know what i mean it's just like a it's just like an antique auction like they can't realistically i mean maybe they i don't know i don't they know do some much. inspection they I'm do sure, oh but. i'm sure they do some inspection but they're not not every single yeah. little tiny trinket is being it's a risk you take yeah 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 um at one point, Koch's lawyers interviewed Kearney on about the fake bottles that Koch had bought from um another collector so these bottles, so Koch bought these bottles from a different collector. Allegedly, they came from Kearney Wan's cellar. Okay. So they tried to get Kearney Wan to say where the source of his wine was, but he kept his composure. He was very kind and friendly during the interview. And after it was all said and done, Koch's lawyer said that he didn't really tell them anything. They didn't really get anywhere. And in 2009, Koch filed a lawsuit against Kearney Wan for the fake wine. Ooh. Yeah. Um, now, Kearney Owan wasn't only having issues with his wine being proclaimed as fake. He was also having financial troubles as well. He defaulted on a $10 million loan with Acker, Merrill, and Condit, the auction house. Now, the auction companies would loan out money to, and then people would buy the wines and then sell them back at the auction for higher prices, like any sort of loan would be. But this is how they were able to beat out other auction com- companies because this is what they were doing. 
Oh, so you're basically like a third party contractor, but you get a loan and then go out and buy it and then come back. I and don't sell think it back this was them? completely normal, but this was what he was doing. Okay. He was doing a lot of borrowing. Um, and in 2012, Spectrum Wine Auctions had a magazine go out, which had Kearney Awan's wines in them. They wouldn't disclose that they came from him and they so that they wouldn't have to pull the product. But people knew that this was his wine because of the labels in the outside of the bottle matched other counterfeit wines. And one bottle even had a spelling error. It's like, oh, this is a Pinot Gris shop. <laughs> well, like one like had the address of the winery on it. And, like, the street name was spelled wrong. Ooh. So it was, like, stupid little mistakes. Like, you can look up the street name and print it. Like, you can make sure that's correct. You can also make sure that the wine distributed that wine in those years. Like, there was some stuff that happened that yeah, especially if he you, just got sloppy. If you love wine that much, you should know about the wine, right? Right. And one, one, one wine lover saw this on the Spectrum website and he published a warning that uh, that these wines were fake and it went viral. Spectrum ended up withdrawing the wine and it was worth an estimated $785,000. So when this was all going down, the FBI ended up getting involved and the FBI, yeah. yeah. The FBI is getting involved with counterfeit wine? Yes. Um, all right. The FBI started going to his friends' houses and interviewing them. And Kearney on, he had a friend call him up. He's like, dude, like, dude, they're actually coming after you. Like, I don't know what. So his friend at the time, he did not know that he was doing this. But he was like, because they were like, do you know Rudy Kearney on? Blah, 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 blah. And so his friend called him. He's like, dude, there's something going on. Like, I think you need to be careful. And Kearney on assured him that he had it all under control. Do we think he had it under control? No. <laughs> On March 8, 2012, the FBI arrested Kearney Awan at his home in Arcadia, California. Kearney Awan lived with his mother, who it appeared he was taken care of. Um, he was indicted on several counts of mail fraud and wire fraud. When the FBI went to arrest Kearney Awan, the house was littered with wine. There was literally wine everywhere. Like, every, like boxes of wine. Oh, my God. Up. He is a wine dragon. He's just hoarding his wine. Sitting Literally. On, sitting on his hoard. Literally. Fighting off wine hobbits. So there were when they arrested him, there were bottles there were bottles in the sink that were being soaked so that the labels could be peeled off of them. There were corking devices. There was a mixing station, bottles with notes written on them. So he would like write the um recipes of like how to change it. He was like making these concoctions so that the wine would taste as legitimate as possible. That's a lot of work. It was so much work. <laughs> and they found like this these boxes with thousands of labels in them. It was a big operation. Oh damn. So yeah. he, so he was making all of these bottles like how many bottles were fake that he was making do you think? So many. Cuz at first I, well, like when you're telling the story I was like, "Oh, okay, he's like He's like doing a couple because he knows, but like Somebody, he's selling so this one, much fake wine. One account I saw said fifteen thousand bottles. That's so much. Yeah, um, I'm gonna skip up, but yeah. So obviously he maybe I didn't write that down. Okay, so he obviously like couldn't do that all alone. You know what I mean? Yeah. And it was believed that his family that he had people involved with this. Now, his mom lived with him. I do think that his mother was involved. Um, he has a brother. It's believed that his brother was involved. But his brother lived in Indonesia, and he's claiming he's getting all these wines from Indonesia. So it wouldn't surprise me if they had people in Indonesia making all these wines and then sending them over to him. Damn, so it's like a whole ring. I think it was, a, like, that wasn't totally explained, but that's kind of my whole, that's my theory. Because you can't make 15, like, five people can't make 15,000 bottles of wine within, like, a five-year period. Yeah, that's fair. Like, that's like come fair. on. We were outsourcing something. 3000 a year? Yeah, it's a lot. It's a lot. And one of his friends said that Kearney Awan, said this about Kearney Awan, he is the last person I would think would be able to do intensive arts and crafts. And his friend was maintaining his innocence. But I, like, I like how he intensive arts and crafts. Like he's like, I don't know, man. Rudy couldn't even do a macaroni drawing. Did you see that Christmas ornament? We still put it up to make him feel good about himself. But, but it looks it, like shit. It's awful. Have you ever seen a Hanukkah Christmas ornament? The guy can't even. 
He didn't even know what Christmas was. He was very confused. I don't think he's making the wine labels now. I don't think <laughs> um, but there was lots of evidence saying that he was making those wines. Um, he was purchasing thousands of dollars worth of wax, paper with antique properties, empty bottles, scanning scanners and for the labels, and printing them. If he just put some of this effort into just like working more on auctioning wine like i think he would have been fine yeah like why did people do well, this well and passant even said or passant passant even said like they were good fakes he's like the only reason i can tell is because of like the shading of the one label he's like that's how i know but if you like don't actually know he's like yeah crazy it would pass so remember how we were like how is kernio on rich yeah we didn't know how he was rich okay so, his uncles were involved in the biggest bank robbery in the history of Jakarta. Not the famous Jakarta bank robbery. Yes. His uncles also defrauded, so his uncle also defrauded his own bank, and it is known as one of the biggest fraud scandals in Indonesian history. Oh, oh, dang. Okay. Um, of the $780 million that his uncle stole, less than a tenth of it has been recovered. Oh, dang. Yeah. Like, they stole a lot of money. Okay. And his one uncle, I think he's in Australia. Like, he, like, skipped town, and they never could indict him. I think the one did go to jail for a while. But that's how he's rich. Damn, and they only got $78 million back. Yeah. Nice of his uncle to, to pass it down to, him, I know, to another that? fraudster. So it's not, How nice. it, it's not actually known that he was benefiting from his uncle's thievery, but it does check out that like no one knows where this money came from. His parents were modest. Like they like they had normal jobs. Like there's no way like this is where the money was coming from. Yeah. At least the startup to begin making the fake bottles. Oh right? yeah, absolutely. And I'm sure his uncles like had him in on this scheme where they were I mean, they have to launder all that money. You That's know fair. what I mean? And this is a great way to launder money. Yeah. Maybe so they're that, doing it through the auction houses. You, yeah. get, you get plants to buy the fake bottles and you they buy it in cash or something. And then now you got that money in an auction and then you can just get the wine back and resell it. That's my theory. Dang. That had was not proven, but that is my theory. It makes sense though. Yeah. So he, he got caught. He got in trouble. Kearney won when he went to trial, he pled not guilty. Um, Kernia one was actually the only person in the scheme who was prosecuted, but it's believed that more people knew what he was doing. I do think that um, John Capon, who was the CEO, I think he knew what was going on. Yeah, all these people knowledgeable about wine and not one person ever was like, something's weird about this. Yeah, I, I think the higher ups knew. I think they didn't care because they were making, making so much money. Because I saw this thing that like John Capon would make 20% of those sales. Oh, yeah, for sure. Yeah, so for it's sure. like he had a lot of incentive. He did not get in trouble at all. I think he did pay back some money um, is what I, I didn't see a number, but he did pay back some people, some of the victims, some money. But like. At least the victims are rich, but yeah. Right, exactly. Like, yeah, this is what's great about this story is no one who like really needed their money is getting hurt. No one's retirement is like, tar like destroyed it's just rich people it's just rich people fucking over rich people which and they wouldn't even know you think rich people will bloviate about wine and all the shit but they probably don't they don't know they're you know they don't know their dick from their ass when it comes to wow, one, when, when it comes to one i couldn't i could i paused i was like i gotta think of something else i can't say that and then you said it i couldn't think of something else so it's just i was like well i guess that's what we're going with his trial started on December 9th, 2013, and it ended on September, I'm sorry, December 18th, 2013. So a very quick little Nine trial. Nine days. Yep. Um, where the jury found him guilty. Nice. And on August 7th, 2014, Rudy Kernion was sentenced to 10 years in prison. That's kind of a lot, actually. It's a lot. For this. Um, there are people who do violent crime who serve less time than this. It's because the victims were rich. Oh, yeah, for sure. They, they're more people than poor people yep. to the eyes of the justice system. Yes. Um, he did not end up serving his whole 10 years, however. And on November 7th, 2020, Rudy Kurniawan was released from prison. That's still six years. Yes. That's longer than most people we talk about that steal more money. Yes. 
And this does not mean he was set free, however, because as soon as he was released, he was sent to ICE, and then he was deported back to Indonesia on April 8th, 2021. Hey, thanks for staying in our prison. Now get the fuck out. I know, like, that didn't what? make sense to me, but he had applied for asylum in 2001 and was denied and he, his asylum and was told that he had to leave the country by 2003, but he didn't do so, and he had been living here undocumented the whole time. Huh. Um, it's estimated that about 10,000 bottles are still in private collections to this day. And Bill Koch did settle out of court for $3 million in damages. Mm. Um, Acker, Merrill, and Condit are still owed. They're never going to get paid back. He's in Indonesia. Yeah. Um, on January of in January of 2015, Kearney Wan's personal wine collection was examined for real wine um, to like sort what was real and what was fake. And there was an auction to repay his victims. The authentic wines were sold for $1.5 million. That's probably not as much authentic wine as you'd think be in there. No. All right. Not at all. Well. So, with all that said, unlike Jesus, Rudy Kernion could not turn water into wine. He could turn wine into money. He could, and he especially couldn't, couldn't turn it into 1947 Lafleur. although he tried his hardest. Kearney Yuan scammed the wealthy and brought doubt into the minds of wine drinkers around the world. Kearney Yuan has proven to us yet again that you cannot judge a wine bottle by its cover. The next time you put that Cabernet Sauvignon to your lips, maybe you'll wonder, am I being scammed right now? No, you're not being scammed because you're drinking Soup Dog 19 Crimes. And it's not a carb Cabernet. It's a red blend. Wait, does Snoop Dogg own 19 Crimes? No, but it's that. That is the one 19 Crimes bottle. It's Snoop Dogg. They have a Snoop Dogg one? No, and it's so good. That's... It's honestly so good. Uh, okay. It's in my top five favorite wines. I'm about to say, that's how you know your wine's real, because when you screw off the top, it, it makes that crack sound. Yeah. So that's how you know no one's messed with it. Yeah. Uh, that's how you find authentic wine. Yeah, I only know that because that's the only kind of wine I drink. It has They have screw tops, so I don't know. I prefer it. I do drink a couple cork. Twice. Yeah, I want to put... It's so hard to get a cork back in a bottle. Oh, yeah, yeah. And now yeah. it's a little bit too tall. It doesn't fit in the fridge if it's a white wine. That's annoying. Yeah. You know? Just screw it on. Like, we have the technology, guys. Why, why are we making this harder than it needs to be? I know. Hmm? Here we are. Hmm? Here we are. Well, thank you so much for listening. I hope you enjoyed today's lighthearted episode. If you enjoyed what you listened to, um, you can always support us in a lot of free ways. One of those ways is by following us on social media at facebook.com slash white collars, red hands on Twitter at white collars pod on Instagram at white collars, underscore red hands on TikTok at white collars, red hands. Um, you can always suggest episodes. If you want to do that, we love getting suggestions. You can do that by going over to our website at white collars, red hands.com. Um, you can also buy merch on there as well. If you don't want a free way to support us, other free ways to support us is by rating us and leaving us a review. Although we love five-star reviews, fi um, honest ones are good too. Um, what's the other thing? Oh yeah, tell a friend, phone a friend, let them know about us. Lots of people traveling for the holidays, going to be listening to podcasts. Let them know about us so they could take a little listen. And uh, I think that's it. Oh, uh, you can recommend episodes to us Oh yeah, by sending us an email. If you also want to support us uh, by email, you can go in there and send a message, uh, something along the lines of, uh, Kashan, you're enough. Don't believe don't believe what your parents told you when you were a kid. You're enough, and it's going to be okay. No, if, I, if someone out there wanted to send me that, that would be... Sad. No, it'd be fine. I'd, I would be appreciative of it. Uh, so whitecollarsredhands at gmail.com is where you can send that, or you can drop us a line on whitecollarsredhands.com. Thanks so much, you guys. We'll see you next <laughs> week on another episode of White Collars. Red, Red hands. hands. This is a princess wave. <laughs> Be nice. Elbow, elbow, wrist, wrist. <laughs>